Well, church, today we're going to be looking at in our future series as we continue on. And I'll tell you this, that I think we'll continue on with this um, uh, just into the month of March. We'll finish this up and go back to where we belong. And that is uh, going to a book of the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It's what we love to do here. It's, it's the way that uh, the Bible was taught by Jesus himself and uh, expositional teaching. But you guys know for these last several months, we've been looking at the future series and it's been deliberately and intentionally brought to you because of not only the days and the age in which we live in, but how we need to know what the Bible speaks about the future. And what God does in the Bible is that he gives us his word and think about it. The, the youngest part of the Bible for us, the New Testament, specifically the book of Revelation, uh, is 2,000 years old. But when you go back to the Old Testament and you read the great prophets of Israel, you come to the quick conclusion that though those prophets spoke thousands and thousands of years ago, the relevance of what they spoke is not only now, but it is yet to come. Only God's word can do that. And that's why we hold the Bible in high esteem. And God's word speaks to us. It's alive. It's, it's living. I was asked this week, how can we know for sure that the Bible is true? For example, I was asked, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, but how did he know? How did he know Genesis and Adam and Eve and all that kind of stuff? And I said, well, the scripture answers that in the New Testament. That the Holy Spirit spoke to Moses and authored the first five books, just like the Holy Spirit has authored all 66 books of the Bible. And then the person came back and said, but how do we know that that's true? And that's a great question. Good, good question. The answer is because of Bible prophecy. Church, listen. That's why prophecy is so foundational and so important. God is the only one. The God of the Bible has revealed history in advance. It's called prophecy. And when he writes history down in advance, then he expects you and I to have our Bibles open and to be watching and waiting for these events that he's written about to happen. And listen, this is what's fun. Every one of the prophetic prophecies given by God in his word that have been fulfilled... 100% of them have been fulfilled literally. Which means, that's right, which means the remaining prophecies that shall be fulfilled will be fulfilled literally. So what we're talking about as believers is how do we live at a time like this where our world seems to be falling apart, seems to be upside down, seems to be crazy. But that's not true because we know the word of God and what God's word says, everything's falling right into place. Nothing's coming apart. Things are coming together. And what looks like hopelessness to the world is hope for the believer. It all depends on how you see and how you look. And I'm happy to report that as Bible-believing followers of Christ, we look through a biblical worldview. We look through this book, and that's how we see the world around us. And when we live like that, that immediately sets us up in obedience to heaven while at the same time, opposition to this world and to hell itself. And so church, we're going to be looking at someone today that normally you would never think of as being a, uh, a player or even a book of Bible prophecy, and yet it is. And today it will be a book that speaks to us as we glean a part out of it. And that is the book of Esther today. And we're going to be looking at a key portion of scripture. So I'm going to ask all of you to stand and the title of our study today is, For Such a Time as This. You know it. Very, very popular theme of the book of Esther. But um, I will read the odd-numbered verses. If you'll read the even-numbered verses, just several of them. But we'll go from verses 13 down to verse 16. And this is in chapter 4, New King James Version Bible, please, if you would. Esther 4.13 begins here saying, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, quote, do not think your heart, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Yeah. 
Verse 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Father, we pray that the very presence of your Holy Spirit to think that we're reading right now your word that was authored some 2,600 years ago, uh, your Holy Spirit's here today to illuminate your truth again to us and our generation. So Father, we pray that as we get into this, you would speak to us now. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. amen, amen. You can be seated for such a time as this. That is an affectionate term. It has been used uh, throughout generations and devotional books and commentators in their writings have often said and made a uh, modern day application to their generation that who knows, but you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. We've, we hear that all the time and so we should. And the challenge as it has been these weeks is, but do we believe this? For such a time as this, how big is your God? Does he orchestrate, does he manifest himself in his sovereignty to be in control and to be in charge? And that is a great challenge because many of us today will look around the world and we'll see the injustice and the pain and the brutality and the violence and the ugliness of human life, and we'll throw up our arms and ask the question, where is God? In fact, isn't that the big indictment of the unbelieving world? If you believe in a loving God, then why is all this happening? And I understand their question. Before I became a Christian, that was my question. But then when you pick up the Bible and read about it, that's exactly where the answer comes to us from, because the Bible says this world is a painful place with horrible pain and suffering, because this is a world that is adrift, alienated from God. It is a world that is departed from God. It is a world that has said, we don't want God to rule over our lives. And listen, you can't, you can't have it both ways. If you say, I don't want God to rule in my life, then listen, when you crash your, your nose into the wall, you cannot blame God for the wall being there. <laughs> You're running without God. And that's the great dichotomy of the world in which we're in today. A world of darkness and a world of light. Depends on where you look. Depends on what you're focusing on. But the events that have led up to this moment, this harrowing moment of Esther is pretty awesome. It reads like a classic novel or a Hollywood script. You all know this. That there's the beautiful damsel by the name of Hadessa. Really, her name's not Esther as you and I know that. You know, Hebrew, her name's Hadessa. Her Babylonian pagan name was given to her by the name of Esther, which is uh, to be named after an ancient Babylonian goddess, Ishtar, uh, which, by the way, we get the word Easter. Did you know that? Easter is the pagan worship of Eshtar, the Babylonian goddess. And Esther is named after that Babylonian goddess. Now, uh, just a little side note, we're coming up on what we would say as believers, Resurrection Sunday morning. Okay, well, it's Easter. Well, it's not about bunnies. It's not about chocolate eggs. It's interesting because, listen, the pagan world will always try to mask God's reality with knockoffs and detractors. So it's just like everything in life, light, dark, true, false. We're going to be coming up on the celebration. It depends on how you look. It depends on what you're looking through. You're either going to celebrate, celebrate bunnies and chocolate and a day to sleep in, or you're going to get up early and you're going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Uh, two, different, two different great things there. And so keep that in mind. So there's Esther, the beautiful damsel, and she is beautiful. You'll hear a little bit more about that. The Bible says she's beautiful. When the Bible says someone's beautiful, they must be. And the Bible says she was beautiful in all forms. That means she had a beautiful mind. It means she had beautiful teeth. It means that she had a beautiful body. It means that she had beautiful hair. Just like 
think about what the Bible says about David. David was a handsome man. When the Bible says, when the Bible, the Holy Spirit says, he's handsome. He's handsome. That when the Bible says Absalom was a handsome man, that, now that guy looks got him in trouble. But Saul was a handsome man, the Bible says. And we know that uh, Ruth was a handsome, or handsome. I mean, Ruth was a beautiful girl. <laughs> Can you be a handsome girl? That's kind of weird. But Esther was uh, a beautiful woman, the Bible tells us. And this is a, a tremendous story for sure. Remarkable story. Then there's the gentle, kind, loving Uncle Mordecai in the story. He actually, if you read all that, all the scripture through, yeah, she was adopted by him and uh, raised by him. Mordecai, Mordecai was an, an amazing man of character. We know from the book of Esther, he was a man of strong convictions. <laughs> I laugh because he's the man. He, I think I would hope Mordecai would feel comfortable in this church because you know why? He got in trouble because he wouldn't bow to the crazy demands that offended God by his local government. His gov the, the government he lived in uh, made demands of all the Jews that they would bow to this pagan uh, decree and, and Mordecai wouldn't bow. And, and it set him up against a culture but here we are reading about him in the Bible. And then there's King Ahasuerus. That's a title. We know him by his name, Xerxes. And uh, he was the ruler of the known part of the world at that time. In fact, in Esther chapter 1, verse 1, listen to this. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in those days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom. Massive dominance of this man's power. So you've got the king and you've got now Esther who's queen. We don't need to get into, we'll wait for the study of the book, how Vashti uh, became deposed as queen and Esther was brought in and established as queen and the dynamics behind that. But then there's the man who... Uh, you may or may not know of, uh, if you've read your Bible, you've heard of this guy by the name of Haman. Yeah. Very good. Do you know what happened up here? These people started to hiss. Whenever you hear the name Haman in Israel, if you're Jewish, you're supposed to hiss. And um, it's a mockery. Uh, Purim, the Feast of Purim is all about Haman being destroyed by the sovereign work of God in the lives of Mordecai, King Ahasuerus, and Esther. Uh, because as we'll see today, and this is how it ties into our message, Haman was an anti-Semite. Haman wanted every Jew to be killed. Haman made plans to e eradicate from the world every Jew. And that was his plan. And he was obsessed with that plan. He was the second most powerful man in all of the kingdom, but he wasted all of his energy and all of his power and all of his uh, tremendous responsibility writing executive orders. I mean, I mean, writing an order, <laughs> writing an order to destroy all the Jews. Instead of doing something with his power, he just wanted to go after everything that God was establishing. And Haman became obsessed and accomplished nothing, actually it turns out, but to destroy his own life and the life of his family. He was a man given over to jealousy and rage. The Bible tells us in Esther chapter 3 verse 2 that Mordecai the Jew would not bow or pay homage to Haman. Can you imagine? Everybody's bowing down and there's Haman. And remember, he hated the Jews. So here comes this Jew. And I, I'm telling you, I want to see this. I hope God replays this in heaven. Everybody's bowing down and Haman is like, yes. Think about him like an antichrist type. The antichrist wants everyone. He's going to want everyone to bow to him, bow to him, right? But the tribulation saints, they won't bow to him. The remnant believing house of Israel, they will not bow to him. So everyone's bowing, and there's Haman, oh, all excited and getting, you know, this narcissistic weirdness going on. And then here, go, here comes old man Mordecai. He's just, right? And he, who knows if he just can go, you know? 
at Haman, or he just walks by. And... But Haman was obsessed with this Jew who wouldn't bow. Obsessed. The Bible tells us also that in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, as we read a moment ago, for if you remain completely silent at this time, Mordecai says to now Queen Esther, his adopted niece, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, girl, don't miss your opportunity here. You think you got your job being the queen because you're a cutie? God's working. This whole thing, Esther, God is working. And he's working out a deliverance of his people. So don't think for a moment, Esther, that you being cute and you being the queen, you're going to escape the wrath of this angry Ahasuerus, Xerxes, who is going to eradicate the Jews based upon the coercion of Haman. You're not going to escape. When they find out, in other words, when they find out, Esther, that you're a Jew, your head's coming off like everybody else. Tremendous statement. And so that word goes on to say, and I love it, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And that's our point today, church. Who knows? Listen, can you hear me? Anybody? Raise your hand if you can hear me right now. Raise your hand if you're breathing. Listen, I, I can honestly say this. I mean this with all my heart. I want to assume that every one of you are born-again believers following Jesus Christ today. But let's say there's somebody in here that's not a believer that's following Jesus in life today. I, I can still say this with what I believe conviction. That who knows, but whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Number one, the believers in this house right here, right now, God is saying to you, who knows, but for you now that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe the answer is yes, because my God wastes nothing. He wastes nothing, not a moment. And the fact of the matter is that you are alive right now, Christian, no matter what or where you may be or who you may be, you are living right now by the awesome decree of God. It's God's will that you be alive right now. To not believe that is to fall into fear, is to fall into depression, is to fall into meaningless existence. And who wants that? But to the unbeliever or the one today that's not following Jesus, I want to say to you right now, listen, you think you moseyed on in here today? You think you just listened to the bribes of your friends that they'll buy you breakfast after <laughs> service? That's why you came? You think that you're watching right now or you're tuning in because, uh, you know, it's what you ought to do? I got news for you. The God of the Bible is announcing to you, who knows, but for such a time as this, that you're listening to the things of the kingdom. God is coming after you. He's coming after you with love, hope, forgiveness, and grace. He, that's his invitation to a lost world, and you need to respond, because eventually there's judgment coming, and he wants you to be free from that judgment. He wants you to be rescued from all of that. So the truth of the matter is, we're looking at this today regarding this 21st century. That God has application for our lives. He's appointed us to this purpose. And he's given us really what we would call perhaps a big idea. And that big idea is God's in control. Christian, God is in control. In all the things of life that dishevel you, know that God's in control. He, he, never, he never once told us, you need to understand what I'm doing in the world. Do you know that? God never said that. Now, Jack, sit down. You need to understand everything I'm doing. He, he's never said it. He's not saying it. And he'll never say it. You want to know why? Because it takes faith to follow him. When he says, I got this. Faith says, mm, okay. Yes, Lord, you, I'm, I'm backing away from it. You got it. Okay, doubt says, uh, it's okay, God, I'll take it from here. <laughs> because I can't trust you, I'm terrified, I gotta control this. Esther was in that place of, hey, I'm the queen, I don't wanna get involved, and nobody knows I'm Jewish. And Mordecai comes with absolute truth and reality. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says, Know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world. 
You know who believed that, by the way? You might be shocked to find this out. Ben Franklin put it this way, God governs in the affairs of men. Isn't that cool? God governs in the affairs of men. In fact, can you guys put up that, you have a low, um, yeah, did you look at this? These, this is the cartoon. This is one of his, uh, in one of his books, in one of his uh, science books. At the top, that's um, Ben Franklin's actual writing. And you see the writing, you see, by the way, see those glasses? And you see the line in the middle? Do you know why there's a line in the middle? That's right, he invented the bifocal glasses, among many other things. But Ben Franklin had written, that's what that, the bottom uh, makes clear what's written at the top. He says, the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see uh, this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. Ben Franklin wrote that. Remarkable. He's echo echoing Daniel, Daniel 4, 17. So church, write it down, number one, for such a time as this, you are here. Write that down, please. You need to know this. <laughs> it's almost like, am I me? Am I here? Yes, you are you, and yes, you're here. God's word is announcing to us right now, you're here. It's not an accident. You are here. You're living, you're breathing, you're hearing right now. You're processing this. In all of Esther's life, she could speak about, wow, wait a minute, I was born in such and such a place. I was raised in such and such a family. I lost my family. My, my nation was taken captive. I was carted away to Shushan. Babylon region of the world, and I've, I've, I've been taken out of the populace of this pagan nation, being a Jew. I was picked out, and they tell me it was because of my looks, and I've been pampered, and, they, and we'll read it later when we go through the book of Esther. Girls, you're going to love it. Ladies, you're going to think it's fantastic. They had this incredible department that was uh, assigned to all of the women of the king's harem. They, were, they soaked in oil. They were given perfumes. They were given massages. They were given the best uh, fabric. They were just, it was, it was like, I don't know. It was like Hollywood, I guess. I don't know what... It's like the spa of the, of the world. And she's now realizing, wait a minute, wait a minute. All this is, isn't a bunch of dumb luck. Mordecai reminds her, there's a plan in your life. Because every one of us can say, well, I came from a world of captivity. Or I came, a, came from a world of beauty. I, I came from a world of being exiled. Or I came from a world of poverty. She could say yes to all those things. Are you hearing me? And to conclude that God is at work. And I want to say to you today, because we're living in a, in a prophetic time, and Jesus Christ is coming back soon, and we want to be busy about our Father's business. He announces to us that you're here now for a purpose. In Psalm 91, verse 15, the Bible says, and I'm reading this verse out of the New Living Translation, when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. You need to make that verse a promise to you. Psalm 91, 15. And in the hour and in the day of trouble, God says, I'm there. I'm going to answer you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to rescue you. God's word says that. Are we not in a day of trouble? Yes, we are. You're here and God is on his throne in heaven and his will is being lived out. And I know I speak for you when I say, you don't want to miss on on that. You want to be right in the middle of that. Whatever God's going to do next, let's be there. Let's do that. Whatever he wants. Amen. Amen. That all that's happened in your life, good, bad, and ugly, God brings it and he redeems it. What a redemptive God. This morning coming in, driving here, I saw somebody probably heading to a car show. It was a 1968 uh, Chevy SS. What is that? SS. I think it was a Camaro. And it's just perfect. And I pulled up alongside and I'm looking at it. And you know, the guy, the guy, he's a little bit. <laughs> Nobody does that driving a Yugo. <laughs> you could tell. What, what, what did that look, look like? That look was saying, this car is restored. This car has been brought back to its former glory. This car looks brand new. This car is going to a car show to show off. 
<laughs> he was talking about redemption. He was showing a picture in his face of redemption. I love Zephaniah. Zephaniah tells us that when you and I get to heaven, it says the Lord is going to look at us and he's going to rejoice over us. And the Bible says that he's going to twirl or spin about with joy. And he, excuse me, hello, he is going to sing. Wow, what is that going to be like? It's called heaven. I don't know. It's called heaven. But God's going to say, <laughs> Jack, woo, yeah. Can you imagine? Don't, can, can, don't you get the feeling that you're going to get tiptoe in? It's like you're not supposed to be there. Oh, I hope nobody checks the records too closely. I'm afraid I might find out I'm not supposed to be here. No, the Bible says a broad entrance is going to be supplied to you from Jesus Christ. Trust him. And when you enter in, the Bible says God is going to look at you and say, woo, and he's going to sing. Can you imagine that the God who invented singing sings? It's going to be something. Wow, that's going to be awesome. No, listen, you're here right now for a purpose, church. These last day's events include you. That's thrilling to me. God, how do you want to use me should be our prayer. And here's the catch. God seems to show up the biggest throughout the Bible in our lives when we're in trouble. Esther was in trouble. She's just trying to hide from it. Mordecai was in trouble. Daniel was in trouble. Noah was in trouble. Moses was in trouble. You want to make a difference? Get in trouble. God will show up when you are standing for him. And you got to be in trouble. We're called to trouble. I mean that no good way. We're ordained to trouble. The Bible tells us we're appointed to trouble. But I want to just give you the fine print. Our God shows up in times of trouble. In every situation, we are tasked with the joy of knowing him. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, listen to this. God works, my friend, according to his divine appointments. I believe this. I, 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 I hope this matters to you, but in my life, I try to remind myself constantly that whatever is going on is by divine appointment. I don't want to get out of his appointment book. So when something happens, I got to stop and say, okay, wait a minute. I just got a flat tire. I got to pull over. This is an inconvenience, but then maybe God is sparing me from something worse. But maybe not. Maybe God has allowed this flat tire to happen because I'm supposed to encounter the person I'm going to call right now, and that's my triple A number, to get a tow truck. So when the tow truck shows up, I am going to see if this is a divine appointment. So when the guy says, hey, you uh, got a flat tire, huh? Yeah, you know what? Driving to an appointment right now myself, this happens. Hey, look, I'm a Christian. I don't know. You got to thank God even when you get a flat tire. He's got a purpose in it. And the guy will go, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but you laid it out there. And then now the whole time, he's either going to drive you or, it's, or uh, fix it. But he's got to fix your tire or he's got to take you somewhere. He's captive. <laughs> it's like a poor man in an Uber car. I have no mercy on an Uber, Uber driver. And when I get in, a, I, I call the Uber at the airport. I need to get picked up. The guy comes to pick me up. Okay? He picked me up. It's a little contract going on there. He's got to take me to my destination. I'm in the back seat, so I can't see his face to see what his reaction might be. Every Uber car I get in, I let them have it. It's true, and it's amazing, because, hey, how, what, what's your name? My name's Muhammad. I don't know why, but every Uber driver's name's Khalid or Muhammad. And I'll tell them, hey, wow, are you religious? Yes. Well, me too. Have you ever heard of Jesus? The Jesus of the Bible? And what do they do? They're just driving. They got to go. They gotta, they're stuck. <laughs> Divine appointment. Every moment of our lives, because listen, I believe it is so true. Our God is sovereign. And all along the way, in the book of Esther and all through her life, God was arranging appointments. She didn't see them. They were revealed to her. Then when she looks back, she says, now I see. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to by God, Peter is preaching, to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves also know, 
Him being delivered by, listen, this is post crucifixion, post resurrection. Jesus has ascended back to heaven. Peter's now preaching. Listen to this. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by your lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. Man, that's the power of God. God is at work, but how you respond to the fact that God's at work, it establishes God's will. He's going to do his will, but at the same time, when he does it, you better choose which side you're on. God's predetermined counsel was that for his son Jesus to be crucified. What we're responsible for is believing in him and what you're responsible for in your own life is if you don't. That's a true statement. God called, God ordained, God appointed. Jeremiah chapter one, verse four. Please make this your own. Jeremiah uh, chapter one, verses four and five. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Church, stop right there. Is that not a truth of God, period? Whoever you are, did God not know you in your mother's womb? The Bible says yes. It's not just Jeremiah. It's you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. It means I set you aside for a purpose. The God of the Bible, who gives you life, who brings you into this world, has done so with a purpose. Okay? You need to remember that. Big time, this whole movement of this nation to go one year ago, to go from the most pro-life nation in history to now the most violent, baby-killing nation that we have ever known. How does that happen? Listen, just know this. You're going up against the God of heaven who says before a baby's even conceived, I know them, watch. Wow, listen. The baby's conceived, I fashion them in the womb, and when they're born, they find out I have a sanctified purpose for their life. And then somebody comes in and cuts that baby's head off and interrupts the whole plan. You think God takes that lightly? No. Oh, God, and believe me, he doesn't just forgive and he doesn't forget. That will generate the wrath of God, and it is coming. God says, I knew you before I formed you, before you were Born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. God wants to use you in impossible ways. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. Joshua 1, 5 and 6. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. I love that. If your name's Mary, you ought to just make that to be like Mary chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Is your name Bill? Make it Bill chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. You don't have to be named Joshua to have that promise. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. This is Paul speaking. Galatians 1, 15 says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles... God's got a plan for your life. An unborn baby, God's got a plan for their life. Don't interrupt the plan of God. Go with the plan. But we're here right now for a purpose, church. There's a reason. You're alive because God's got a plan. Acts 17, 28. The Bible says, Paul speaks again to the Athenians there in Greece. He says, for in him, that is God, we live and move and have our existence or our being. Our very personality lives before God. So that in every moment of every day of every life situation, one thing is for sure, Ben Franklin was right because Ben Franklin leaned on Daniel 4. God's in control. Number two, for such a time as this, here they come. Here they come. There's, listen, here they come, meaning Mordecai's. The Mordecai's are here, yes. The encouragers are here, yep. God has brought his people and uses them everywhere, but here they come, who? The Hamans. The Hamans of life, are they not coming? Are they not here? 
The Bible talks, in fact, read it later. It's a fantastic read. Read 1 John, the whole chapter, or the whole book, I should say. It would take you a whopping 10 minutes. It's only five chapters. 1 John will talk so much about the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, and many people who follow the Antichrist spirit in our day today. We could, this morning, just say, call them Hamans. They are bent on control. They are bent on offending the God of heaven. They are bent on exterminating God's people. You say, how is this a Bible study on futures and Bible prophecy? Because our current environment is against God's people and committed to exterminating God's people and to silence God's people. And it's increasing. Why? The spirit of Haman is here. And obviously, there's always been that spirit of Haman to eradicate the Jewish people. Think about that. When you read the Bible, and when you read human history, the Jewish people are by far the most persecuted people that have ever lived on earth. Nobody comes close. I don't care what color you are, or I don't care what belief system you have. As Christians, we've been persecuted for 2,000 years. That's nothing compared to what the Jews have gone through. Why? Because Satan hates them. Be careful. Don't get on the side of Satan. I don't know any Jews, but I hate them. Really? You're kind of satanic. You probably have horns on underneath your hat there. What is that all about? Satan hates the Jews. Why? Because, listen, God tapped the Jews to bring us this book. God tapped the Jews, listen, God tapped the Jews to have them live life as an example so that we would look at what God is doing with them and that we would have hope. Listen, God chose to be a Jew when he came into the world. He could have been a Canadian. He could have been a, he could have been a Pole. He could have been a Peruvian. Seriously, he could have picked, the nations are his. He could have said, you know what, I'm, man, I'm going to come as a Californian. <laughs> nope, he came as a Jew. Isn't that wild? You say, well, the Jews wrote the Bible. It's all, it's all slighted toward them. It's a big conspiracy. It's a Jewish conspiracy. Really, if you had a Jewish conspiracy and you were Jewish, then why would you use this book to make you look like an absolute idiot? <laughs> Have you noticed that? The Bible says the Jews are the most stubborn people on earth. One thing after another, they're disobeying God and they're offending God and they're leaving him to worship pagan gods. No, 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 no. God wrote it to say, if I can save a Jew, I can save a you. And that's a fact. God, listen, God chose the Jewish people for his purposes. Satan hates them. And you better be careful that you make sure that you love them by provoking them to the love of Christ. But here they come. The evil marching on. Washington Times article, I'll read it. It was, uh, this is the image of that article. You can look it up later. Washington Times reported, science tells, listen, science tells us that an unborn child is a human being. That was my response to former uh, Vice President, now President Joe Biden, in a tweet earlier in the week. We need a president who believes in science. So is Mr. Biden a science denier? Now President Joe Biden embraces the extreme view of abortion on demand all the way through to birth. That's called murder, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. That's right. He now supports the all taxpayer funded abortion campaign against the unborn. And God from heaven watches. Here they come. They're against the gospel, they're against religious freedom, they're against what is true. Isaiah chapter 5, listen, Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20, you listen to this verse and then you ask yourself if God does not know what he's talking about when he speaks about the future. Isaiah 5, 20, 21, woe, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, woe, verse 21, to those who are wise in their own eyes. Experts, by the way. The word wise in their own eyes is an expert in their own eyes. Experts, experts, experts. And then the word woe twice. Woe, God says, woe 
That word means, aha, we don't, we don't care what that means. Oh, so what? Aha. Oh, in Hebrew, that's bad. Aha. It means, listen, it means damned or condemned are you. Remember when Jesus came on the scene and said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, blind guides. Remember that? Tremendous. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. This is the age in which we live. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, meaning the Bible. So listen, evil men and imposters are growing worse. Do you believe that? Then be on guard and watch out, because here they come. For such a time as this, you're alive to not only be used by God in this divine appointment, but also to be on guard against those that are coming. I shared this on Wednesday night. I'm going to read it again. Please allow me to elaborate a bit. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 1 through 7 right now. Listen to this. Here they come. And again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, that's what God called Ezekiel, speak to the children of your people. Think about this. Maybe uh, the generation of believers today. And say to them, when I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword come in upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be upon his own head. Verse 5, he who heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, that is God's judgment, coming, and does not blow the trumpet, that is the trumpet of warning, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. And you can read that again as I did last Wednesday night. And you can make it this way. Every time you read that, when you say, for example, in verse 2, when I bring the sword upon the land and the people or the church in the land take a man of their territory and make him to be their pastor... And when he sees the sword coming upon the land, are you with me? Do you get that? If that pastor blows the trumpet of warning and people don't listen, then listen, those people are on their own. But if the, tr- if the pastor blows the trumpet of warning and people respond, then they're saved, rescued by the trumpet blast of the pastor warning. But God says in the days when my hand will be heavy upon the land in judgment, if that pastor does not blow the trumpet, then I will require at his hand the blood of those who did not hear the warning. And we live in a time right now, here they come. It's not only falsehood in politics and falsehood in business, but it's falsehood in ministry, falsehood in the pulpits. Be careful, watch out. You, my friend, are alive for such a time as this. God wants to use you in a radical way. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Number three, for such a time as this, here you stand. We're called to stand. Now I gotta watch myself over this one because I have to, I have more to teach on. I just have to watch that clock because this thing is a big deal to me about standing. Somebody has said, if we don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything. Somebody has well said that by being silent in the face of a situation is to be in agreement. Sir Edmund Burke in the Parliament of England during the revolutionary period of the United States and the colonies, I should say, Edmund Burke said, all evil needs to do to triumph is for good men to do 
nothing. And the Bible warns us that in the last days, apathy will be here. But we are called to stand, you and I are. Esther was called to stand. Esther, listen, don't think your cuteness is going to save you. God's brought you into the kingdom for such a time as this. And think about it. The Bible goes on to tell us that she's going to walk in. She's not supposed to. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Esther that her and the king had not been together for 30 days. Maybe they, they were on the outs. Something was wrong. She hadn't talked to him for 30 days. She hadn't seen him in 30 days. And you couldn't walk in. He had to raise his scepter to allow you to come in. She went in unannounced. You know what that means? It's punishable by death. She realizes, okay, here's what's up. I either take a stand and I go in and risk my own life to represent my people, the Jew, and to expose to the king Haman's plan to kill every Jew and to hang my uncle Mordecai on the gallows, which by the way, if you read the fine print, Haman had gallows built. I think there were 66, 75 feet they were so tall, exaggerated, in his front yard to hang Mordecai on. He wanted Mordecai to hang in his front yard. I can't wait. He probably had a little tailgate party going on, barbecue happening. He's got his I hate Mordecai hat on. <laughs> and he's just like, this is going to be awesome. That Jew is going to be hanging by a rope by the end of the day. And Esther reveals the plan, and it so infuriates the king that the whole plot turns around on Haman and winds up landing on him. He's the one who winds up perishing. He's the one that winds up hanging. It's, listen, in the world, you build the things that are going to hang you eventually. The very thing that you're flirting with and hugging and stroking and talking to and, and wondering about and propping up and, and, and all that kind of, guess what it's going to do someday? Someday it's going to get you. That's the way the world works. That's the way sin works. And the amazing thing is she was called upon to stand and she realized, man, if I go in there and stand, if he doesn't raise that staff off with my head, that's the protocol of the kings. So she takes her life in her own hands and she walks trusting that God's in this and she walks up there and, he, and the king raises the scepter and, and when she approaches, you're supposed to touch the top of the scepter and then you can talk. So she starts telling them, this is what's up, king. And he gets furious. When we stand as believers, every single one of us, we must take a stand. And I'm going to ask you, church, right now today, I don't care who you are. I don't care how significant, insignificant you think you are or how significant you think you are. I want you to pray about assigning to your life a cause to stand for. Amen. Now, that cause needs to be a cause that glorifies God. But you take a stand for God and you'll be opposed to this world. You need to know that. The world is not going to come up and throw their arms around you. Take a stand. John 16, These things I've spoken unto you, Jesus said, that in me you might have peace. Well, why do you say that? Because in this world you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Man, that's a strong statement. We hate, we hate Christians. We need to shut them down. Like this legislation this week that's going to be now be heading to the Senate that the Bible is a bigoted book. The Bible is hate. The Bible is not in step with modern times. Really, don't be alarmed by that. Stand up. You be ready. You remember this sermon. God's in control. Listen, you're not, you're not, being, you're not being put in the doghouse for that. The governing powers that have left off pursuing God's will, they're in the doghouse. They just don't know yet. The very thing that they're designing to hang you on, according to God, they're, they're going to be hung on that. Remember that. I've, I said it last week. I'll say it again. Read the, if you have any doubts, read the end of the Bible. Read the book of Revelation. Okay? If you have any doubts, read the book of Revelation, and we win in a very big way. Okay? Take a stand. Matthew 10, verse 16. Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, Jesus said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's a really weird statement. I don't... What? Jesus said, what? Can you imagine? Okay, you guys ready? We're ready! 
Are you ready to take a stand? We are so ready. All 12 of them are standing there. Ready. Reporting for duty, sir. You can see Jesus. All right. I'm going to send you out. Send us out. I'm going to send you out like sheep. Sheep. You're the shepherd and we're the sheep. Yeah. I'm going to send you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Sheep in the midst of wolves. What? Are you sure you got that right? They don't mix. Yeah, yeah, Jesus would say, that's the point. I'm going to send you out like a dove. But you need to be smart like a snake. Gentle as a dove. Right? Our hearts are to be gentle. Our hearts are to be soft toward God and compassionate toward all. But wise as a serpent. Yeah, you don't step on snakes. You don't, when's the last time you stepped on a snake? If you stepped on a snake, you, you were in a place you shouldn't have been. Let's be honest, but nobody leaves this building today and steps on a snake. They're too wise. They're hiding out. And Jesus says, when you go out there, I see you like, like sheep. Aww. Yeah, and you're going to be, you're going to go out there, a whole bunch of wolves out there. It means he'll take care of you. Remember, you are the sheep of his pasture. And the wolves are all the hostile unbelievers in the world around you at work and at home. And Jesus says, I got this. I got you. For such a time as this. But I'm a sheep. And that's how you're safe. Because I'm your shepherd. You don't want to be a sheep like, you know, what do you got? You got got a helmet on. (laughs) Sheep with guns. Sheep with grenades. That's ridiculous. Sheep would probably blow themselves up. A, a sheep would shoot himself. What is this? A sheep falls over, first chance it gets. Sheep need shepherds. And Jesus says, I got this. Remarkable. Bible says in Ephesians 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. That's it. You ever see sheep working out? The shepherd works out. So the sheep can be sheep. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Sheep have no might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're living it right now. And it's increasing. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this age. That's demonic activity against hosts and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand or withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, which is able to quench all, hello, all, The fiery darts of the wicked one, reference to Satan and his minions. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, which is awesome. Salvation protects your head. Isn't that great? The helmet. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the Bible. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, being watchful to this end. That's the Christian. That's the life we're living in. Listen, you're going to live that now or you're not. If you live it, you're going to win in Christ. If you don't, you're going to lose at the attack of this world. Isaiah 41, we're almost done. Isaiah 41, 13. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Very quickly, number four, here they fall. You've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And listen, all evil will eventually fall. The end of the wicked is a foregone conclusion, the Bible says. Psalm 37, 18. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. This is God's long view. Psalm 3, verse 11. But the wicked are doomed. 
for they will get exactly what they deserve. Wow. This should, this should cause you to pick sides. Psalm 33:10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. Verse 11. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Notice verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. By the way, that's any nation who makes the God, the, uh, their God the Lord. And then finally, really truly finally, for such a time as this is here we go. We've come to the kingdom for such a time as this and always before us ought to be the exciting words, here we go. Here we go. What does that mean to you? Here we go. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 36 says, for we have need of endurance. We have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, notice this is precious. You may receive the promise, yet for a little while, and he who is coming will come, and he will not tarry, that is, Jesus is not, like, he's not distracted right now. The, the moment that he's coming has been appointed by his father. He's not, like, he didn't make a left turn a couple years ago, and he's trying to find the, oh, no, 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 he's not tarrying. He's not just, you know, hanging out. Oh, I know I was supposed to go get them, but. No, the, the second the father, the second the father says, you go get her. By the way, if you haven't viewed, if you haven't watched, it's on Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime. Go watch it later today. It's called Before the Wrath. Watch it, Before the Wrath. The son is waiting for the father to say, son, you have built this wedding chamber, this, this wedding home beautifully. Go get her. And he's... <laughs> he's after her. A Galilean wedding. But do you see... Do we see? I want to leave you with this picture about here we go. People are being consumed in this day and age. Sad report. United States of America consumes more tranquilizers and mood-altering pills than any nation on earth. The reason why is because we have departed from God's promises. It's easier to pop a pill in the short term than to lift a prayer. One has horrific side effects, the other eternal value. Amen. One will destroy your liver, the other one will give you life. How you see things matters. Ben Franklin's bifocals I want to use in our closing. Right in the middle of his glasses, he drew that line, which demarcated the bifocal. Looking straight ahead, normal glass. Looking down below, magnifying glass. If you've ever had bifocals, you, you see people trying to use them. <laughs> right? That's why they invented transitions lenses. Progressives, thank you, progressive lenses. Because bifocals is like this. And why? Because if you want to look at something close, you go like this. And then somebody says, Do you, is that, hey, how are you? And you go, I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> Hang on a minute, let me read this. <laughs> looking, looking through the difference. You see things differently. You want to see things broad and, and open and then you look to the top. You want to see things up close and magnified and personal? You look to the bottom. How you see matters. Mm -hmm. Esther was educated on her vision. When Mordecai said, don't think you're, you're going to escape. The opportunity is yours to stand up for your people. And if you don't do it, that's on you. You should have blown the trumpet, Esther, but if you don't, it's on you. If you blow it, though... And you let people know, God will deliver his people. But if you don't participate, God will find another, another deliverer. In other words, God's going to get his plan done, right, church? God's going to do his plan in the 21st century right here, right now. I don't want to miss that. 
So when I look through, as it were, spiritually Ben Franklin's bifocals, I want to make sure I'm seeing clearly. I want to make sure I have them on right. I want to make sure I'm wearing them properly. You need to make sure, listen, that you see this word in its entirety. Some time ago, a couple years ago, we were at Universal Studios. Remember that place? It used to be a place, I think it used to be an amusement park. I'm not sure even if it exists anymore. But you get on this tram and they tell you, no, at this one point before you, we enter in, you got to put these glasses on. They put these glasses on. It's 3D glasses. So it was a bright California sunshiny day. So I, I, had my, I had my glasses on because we're driving around Universal Studios outside, all that. You've been on, have you been on that ride? Yes. So we get ready to go into this thing, in this tunnel. I got my glasses on. And so we go in and everybody's at the front of the car and the trailer, they start screaming. Ah! People are like freaking out. You see everybody leaning, and it's like, oh my goodness, wow, this is going to be amazing. So now we get in, and everybody's screaming, my wife's screaming, grandkids freaking out, uh, friends that are with us, they're, ah, and they're spitting stuff flying. There's like, you know, like dinosaurs like, are like spitting at us, and there's this uh, King, uh, King Kong, all that stuff's going on. And I'm, and I'm like, what is this? And everyone's ducking and look out and they look out. Ah! And I'm like, oh, I didn't get it. We got all the way through. And everyone, wasn't that amazing? Oh my goodness, that scared me so bad. Oh, that was so that was like, and I'm going, I don't get it. And I honestly said, I'm not kidding. I was so embarrassed. I, was, I said, look, listen, my glasses were either messed up or something's wrong on that ride. And one of my kids turned to me and they said,
Are you wearing those glasses in there? Yes. Well, you were supposed to wear their glasses in there. I had my sunglasses on. I didn't put their glasses on. So I'm criticizing, this is cheap. What a bunch of junk. People waste their time on this thing. I had the wrong glasses on. I didn't put the right ones on until I got out of the ride and then they didn't work. It was blurry in the ride and then when you put the wrong glasses on the outside, it's blurry. You got to have the sunglasses for the outside and the 3D glasses on the inside. And I didn't, I didn't do it. And I'm criticizing, this is cheap. People are like that today. Oh, I don't get it. That's dumb. This Bible, who needs it? Dude, you got the wrong glasses on. You got to put on the right glasses. And the right glasses is faith in God to do what he has said. And he's saying to you today, you have been brought to this kingdom now for such a time as this. God wants to use you. Father, use these precious people. They love you, Lord. Your word gets inside of them throughout the week and they just start to Power up. Battery starts charging. Light starts emanating out of them. And Father, today, they're going to go out into this world that is terrified and hurt and wounded and lost. And I pray that you would use them. We've all been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this right now. And so, Father, we just pray that on our lips always would be the fact that as we go forward in this battle and we wait for the wonderful arrival of our King, King Jesus, that we would be very careful to say and to announce that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And what, what happy words these next statements are. <laughs> that whosoever would believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, may we go forth bearing precious seed, announcing Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the grave, and that we are forgiven in him, and that we've been given new life, and that we walk in this newness of life to live the purpose for which you've called us into the kingdom for such a time as this, you are glorious. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.